Hello there, and today I'm with Bill Nye, who is the CEO of the Planetary Society, host of the popular TV series, Bill Nye the Science Guy, which won 18 Emmys, best-selling author and a passionate advocate for science and space who's inspired generations uh, of Americans about why science matters. Bill, happy Asteroid Day. Happy Asteroid Day. Um, uh, I, I hope it's always happy. I hope so too, it, it should be. Um, why is the subject of asteroids so important to you? Well, it's the, as we like to say, uh, an asteroid impact here on Earth is the only preventable natural disaster. And uh, this would be a ca catastrophe. You know, when I was a kid, when I was in uh, what in the States we call elementary school, uh, there was no reasonable or good theory as to what happened to the ancient dinosaurs. My second grade teacher read to us from a great big book, the reason the ancient dinosaurs went extinct is because they had small brains. So then the mammals took all the dinosaur food and the dinosaur died. And she, even she knew this is just, that's just not reasonable. Uh, these animals, you know, lived on earth longer than we have. And it's also interesting everybody to keep in mind just how long the ancient dinosaurs roamed the earth. There's more time between the classic Stegosaurus and the Tyrannosaurus than there is between the Tyrannosaurus and us. There's a long time, but the whole thing, that whole ecosystem, the whole deal went, stopped when an asteroid hit. And this was discovered in the 1980s when I was already out in the workforce, making a living working at Boeing on 747 airplanes. And as I like to say, if you're ever on a 747, don't worry. I was very well supervised. They're perfectly it's my safe. My favorite airplane. It's a great plane. It really is. It was at the height of, uh, it was a transition between so-called uh, mechanical control and fly-by-wire. But that aside, uh, it was discovered by people looking for oil off the coast of Mexico. You know, the Gulf of Mexico is, has a very oil-rich, fossil fuel-rich area. And they found this giant ring using magnetometers, compasses on helicopters, and they realized that this enormous impact must have occurred at about the right time, or about exactly the right time to coincide with the disappearance of the ancient, or the demise of the ancient dinosaurs. And convergent with that, for me, I, through, as you may know, some sort of clerical error, I attended Cornell University here in the U.S., and uh, for kicks, as a senior, having completed my mechanical engineering requirements, I took one class from this famous guy, Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan talked a lot about the Tunguska event. And this was, uh, now we realize, what we would nowadays call an airburst. In those days, people didn't really use the term air per, airburst very often. But this is where an uh, 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 a, uh, impactor, a rock, maybe an icy rock, hits the Earth's atmosphere going so fast that the Earth's atmosphere is essentially a uh, planetary brick wall and the thing disintegrates and the shock waves uh, are strong enough to knock down trees for 100 kilometers in every direction. And uh, if you don't believe me, just look at Chelyabinsk, which happened uh, uh, six years ago, and uh, the shock waves blew with the windows out all over the town of Chelyabinsk. And this is a much, much, much smaller object. So the other thing that happened, Carl Sagan and a guy named Jim Pollack, James Pollack, had written a computer program uh, simulating or attempting to simulate what would happen if you somehow set off all the nuclear weapons in the world at the same time, an undesirable outcome. But the, the model, as we call it, indicated that if you did this, you would throw so much debris into the atmosphere or above the atmosphere, nominally above the atmosphere, maybe not beyond the exosphere, but very, very high in the sky. And it would block the sunlight, block sunlight for long enough to create very cold or climatic change on the Earth's surface. And this was an extraordinary thing and it was poo pooed, it's just unreasonable, that just couldn't be, but it was the convergence of this idea that you could create so much debris so fast that you'd cool the earth off enough to wipe out large animals so they couldn't make a living, couldn't get enough to eat. And the discovery of this asteroid impact off the coast of what is now Mexico that led to the idea that, hey man, 
an asteroid could be a catastrophe like nothing anybody's ever seen. And so now uh, school kids, everybody accepts that the asteroid impact is almost certain, or certainly the most reasonable theory as to what happened to the ancient dinosaurs. And you do not want it to happen again, <laughs> no. So uh, the only way to prevent this is using the resources we have in space exploration. So really your love of um, asteroids came from the fear of them hitting Earth or the potential um, that they could cause from hitting Earth. Well, not just that. When you're a little kid, everybody goes to asteroids. I mean, uh, uh, the little prince goes to B612, right? I mean, come on, it's, what's more fun than that? So the other thing is just romantic that you could drive up in a spaceship drive up to an asteroid and you know walk around on it and the gravity would be so low you could jump around and and you know play extraordinary uh, games of uh, cricket or uh, what have you baseball on the surface of an asteroid i mean dressed properly like uh, a spacesuit for example and uh, it, it's just romantic and then the other thing that everybody loves to talk about well you know if you had the right asteroid, it, it, the whole thing would be made of, of stainless steel. Or, no, better yet, the whole asteroid would be made of platinum. And so all you got to do, you know, is drag that platinum asteroid back to Earth, and then you'd have all the platinum you need. It would be common, but it's not that easy to do. But it is, uh, asteroids are romantic. And then scientifically, asteroids are, must needs be made of the same primordial material that, that the solar system's made of. So if you can get hold of an asteroid or pieces of asteroid, it is reasonable that you will learn more about the origin of everything that we know. There's two questions everybody asks. Uh, are we alone in the universe? Is there somebody else out there with whom we could communicate? And the first question maybe is, where did we all come from? Where did we all come from? What are we doing here for crying out loud? And so if you want to know that, if you want to investigate that, you look at asteroids because they're made of this primordial. But the idea is every rock tells a story. And so if you can look at asteroid rocks uh, or ice, you'll learn more, a lot about the origin of the solar system. I love it. I love the the idea that these these seemingly just lumps of rocks, you know, almost like a failed planet. Oh, don't say that to those people, to the <laughs> no, geologists. No, no, don't say that, that to them. That they, to the <laughs> like the story, how we can piece together. You know, you mentioned our origins and are we alone, but also our destiny as well. Because are we going to get hit by an asteroid? And what's the well, what's the future for humanity? I love the fact that that asteroids um, hold the key to like putting together the, you know, that next piece in the jigsaw puzzle to understand. Everybody, taxpayers and voters, citizens of the world, I will guarantee you that we will be hit with an asteroid. I guarantee, that's for certain. Just when, how big it is, are we going to be able to do anything about it? Those are some other very important so-called knock-on questions. Well, can you tell us about um, the work that you've been doing um, with your advocacy work in DC in the US um, with regards to asteroids and space? Planetary Society, as we like to say, is the world's largest non-governmental space organization. If you like birds, what do you do? You join the Audubon Society. If you like the environment, you might join any number of environmental groups that uh, seek to uh, take care of charismatic megafauna. There's a big elephant organization in Britain, for example. Then in the States, we have the Sierra Club. Uh, taking, doing as can to preserve the environment and so on. But if you like space, join the Planetary Society. Just a little plug for us. So what we do is go to Washington, D.C. and advocate in the U.S. Congress for space missions of various kinds and especially looking for asteroids. And the other thing we do worldwide is uh, we provide these grants to uh, amateur astronomers to look for asteroids. Now, there's a famous guy who did a lot of work on asteroid impacts, Gene Shoemaker, and so we named these grants. And Gene Shoemaker, Carl Sagan, then the two other guys who founded the Planetary Society, Lou Friedman, who was an orbital mechanics guy at JPL, and Bruce Murray, who was the head of the Jet Propulsion Lab during these the, the this iconic mission, Voyager and Viking landing on Mars. They knew Gene Shoemaker very well. So we call them the Shoemaker Grants. 
And the difference between an amateur astronomer and an amateur anything else is that amateurs, like an amateur tennis player, an amateur tennis player is great, right? We enjoy amateur tennis players and they uh, do fun things and, and maybe advance the sport of tennis. But an amateur astronomer contributes to the science of astronomy. Just that, so it's a term that's sort of left over. And these are people who use their spare time to watch the skies. And so the key to finding asteroids is you take, it takes a lot of people observing a lot because as the old hilarious saying goes, looking for an asteroid is like looking for a piece of charcoal in the dark. They're very difficult to see. They don't reflect very much light, but they do reflect light in the infrared spectra uh, spectrum uh, beyond uh, infra means below. So infrared means below red, or fr frequencies lower than red, but wavelengths longer than red. Anyway, uh, with that sort of instrument, you can fight, or it is believed that you can find asteroids. So we advocate in the US Congress and Canadian Space Agency and European Space Agency, JAXA, Japanese Aerospace, to build spacecraft that have the proper instruments to look for asteroids. So people estimate that we have found perhaps 90% of the Earth crossing asteroids that could be catastrophic. That's great. What about the other 10%? That leaves 10%. <laughs> yeah. And so it is the only preventable natural 10 like everybody, one out of 10 is uh, fun when you're playing board games with your friends, but one out of 10 is not good enough for a car. You wouldn't get in an airplane that had trouble one out of 10 times, no. So we've got to get, and I say trouble, you can use your imagination. So we want to build spacecraft and instruments and ground-based systems that are integrated with the spacecraft and the scientists and engineers who build these things and study the skies so that we can find asteroids and trace their track because uh, determining their, their trajectories is the key to this thing because it, you got to, if you're going to deflect an asteroid, you got to get out there 10, 20, 25 years before the thing is going to hit the earth because the ones, the catastrophic sized asteroid is huge and uh, it takes a lot to give it a nudge. And so all you got to do though is give it a nudge. You don't have to blow it up. You don't want to go Bruce Willis on the thing because that. Uh, you'll probably just create a shower of material that's on the same trajectory. Then it, it could be even worse. You just want to give it a nudge so it doesn't cross the Earth's orbit when we're there. Do you think we're, we're doing enough or do you think there's more that can be done? I mean, look at the world we're living in today um, and it feels like a science fiction movie with, with some of the things which is going on with COVID-19. Do you think asteroids people just don't take seriously because we've got this Hollywood perception and, and there's more that needs to be done. Well, I think people are taking it more and more seriously because we're educating young people. Because there, there's two things everybody loves when you're a kid. And if somebody tells you they didn't love these things, they're just lying to your face. I know, as we space say. and dinosaurs. Space <laughs> and dinosaurs. So asteroids are where space and dinosaurs are the same thing where they're, they, they converge. Uh, in Venn diagrams, there's an intersection, there's an overlap, there's a shaded uh, sector there or a region. So space and dinosaurs, asteroids, but by getting kids aware of asteroids and ancient dinosaurs and their demise, I think we're gonna be able to have systems in place in the next three decades to really deflect an asteroid. And this is the kind of thing when you, when you're of a certain age, shown here, there's something you want to do for the future. And so even though we may not build systems to deflect an asteroid while I'm running the Planetary Society and being nominally a productive member uh, of society, paying taxes and carrying on and so on, we want our legacy to be that we are ready for an asteroid. Now, if you are a thoughtful thinker of thinkful thoughts, we certainly could build an asteroid deflection system, by that I mean a rocket, right now if we needed to. But we don't want this inertia that we're experiencing right now, inertia being a not only a physical term, but a spiritual term in this usage. 
we don't want this inertia of anti-science that we're experiencing around the world right now, where people's opinions seem to be evaluated, uh, seem to be evaluated or valued by individuals as much as expert opinions. And that's got to change. Well, and it'll change because you can't stay in business. You can't do business globally by pretending physics isn't true. That's not going to, it's just not going to work out for you. Or biology isn't true. You know, people have predicted a pandemic for decades. And the reason we are all here enjoying this uh, broadcast, podcast, this live stream, is because our ancestors lived through the Spanish flu. Uh, if your ancestor died during the Spanish flu, you wouldn't be here kind of thing. So this has been predicted for a long time. And so it's an opportunity perhaps to educate the world on the importance of science. And, and by science, I mean biology. I mean, we wouldn't know that the coronavirus had a crown if it weren't for scanning electron microscopes, people. And we wouldn't have that if it weren't for the discovery of electrons and neutrons and protons. And if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have that without chemistry. We wouldn't have chemistry without biology. And we wouldn't have biology without evolution. Don't make me come over there, people. And so asteroids are part of this larger understanding of the cosmos and our place within it. Well, Bill, I'm so sorry, but we've actually run out of time. But I, Oh, I come on. I, come on. We haven't, we haven't I, talked about all we, these other fabulous I know, things. I know. Don't blame me. <laughs> the, I oh, have I'm so sorry. many questions. And I think um, I think it's it's a great point to end on um, because we are in an interesting time. Um, interesting. Yeah, interesting. In the Chinese proverb. Yeah. Well, one more thing, though, before you goes, go, everybody, is along with all that's going on right now with the pandemic and space exploration and people trying to get humans back to the moon, in very short order, and the success of not you, not only government uh, agencies building rockets, but private companies who sell rockets to government agencies having great success. SpaceX, these guys going to the space station and back. While all that's going on, everybody who's flown in space, everybody, astronauts, taikonauts, uh, cosmonauts, everybody looks down on the earth and comments on what they call the overview effect where you realize everybody on earth is in this together. There are no political boundaries when observed from space. We are all one species. And furthermore, through evolution, we have found that everybody, everybody started out in East Africa. Everybody started out there. And no matter what the color of your skin, no matter what the shape of your facial features, we are all intimately, intimately connected. And humans have run this test billions of times. If you have somebody from Africa interact, can we say interact? Interact with somebody from Northern Asia, all you get is a human. We are all in this together. You don't get some new thing. Humans are one species. And when you look at it, when you look at the earth from space, you realize how fragile our home is and how we all have to work together for a better tomorrow for our children and grandchildren. So everybody, on Asteroid Day, appreciate our place in space. Appreciate that we can understand the cosmos and our place within it through the process of science. And working together, everybody, we can change the world. Thank you very much, Sarah. Let's get out there and get her done. Thank you, Bill. Um, we could have talked for a lot longer, but I'm, I appreciate, um, I think that's a, a great note to end it on. And thank you so much and happy Asteroid Day. Happy Asteroid Day.